Wow, uh, this is intense. So we're going to try to project. Can you guys in the back hear me? We're OK. Oh, beautiful. I got a really big mouth, so I think it'll, I think it'll be all right. Chris does TV. He has a big mouth, so I think we'll, we'll do all right between uh, the two of us. Uh, first, uh, as always with programs like this, I have to go through uh, my thank yous. Uh, this would not be possible without uh, Simmons. Uh, when I was lucky enough to be invited uh, through the MLK uh, Professor and Scholars Program, Dr. Martin Luther King, Professor and Scholars Program, got to nail that. Um, I did not know where I was going to live in Cambridge, and Simmons was nice enough to put a roof over my head. So this is really, really important. So I got to thank them right off the bat. I uh, got to thank the writing and the uh, humanistic studies program, uh, where I have been so lucky to teach and just blessed to interact with the hardest working students I have ever met in my life. I tell them all the time, I don't remember what I was doing when I was 19. I wasn't doing what they're doing. Uh, so that, that just, I mean, it's just been a blessing to be here. Uh, I got to thank the uh, night. I got to make sure I get this right. The night. Science Journalism Fellowship Program for helping us get Chris here, uh, who is sitting uh, with us right now. Uh, and finally, of course, got to thank uh, the Dr. Martin Luther King Scholars and Professors Program. I think I nailed that. I think I got all of that out the way. Um, this is very important. There's a whole ritual in academia, and I'm trying to do my best to get it. So um, on to tonight's program. Uh, when we started thinking about programming at Simmons, there was no one who I wanted to bring here more uh, than uh, Chris Hayes, who's uh, sitting next to me here. Uh, Chris is obviously here for his book, Twilight of the Elites. Um, and the best thing I can tell you about Twilight of the Elites, as far as I'm concerned, is if you read enough uh, political coverage co coming out of Washington, it's a thing that opinion writers like to do, where they say, well, I'm not coming from the left, I'm not coming from the right, the answer somehow lies in that Tom Friedman middle. And you take a guy like me, who's African American, and also kind of a Civil War buff and big on the abolitionists. I know sometimes extremists are really, really right. <laughs> you know, they're just right. You know what I mean? There's no middle ground. Sometimes they're right. Uh, so that just totally burns me up. It's one of my pet peeves in journalism, and just you know, in Washington politics, period. And yet, every once in a while, every once in a while, there's a critique that cuts right across left uh, and right. And Chris Hayes' book, Twilight of the Elites, I really feel like is that critique. But as opposed to finding that middle ground between left and right, Chris just went to a fourth dimension. <laughs> and he's talking about something that's you know, not in the middle, but somehow applies uh, to both the left and right. And that is this notion of meritocracy. And I'll just speak as a, as, a, as a pinko commie, being the pinko commie that I am. I won't speak for right wingers. But I will say that as someone who the civil rights movement had a huge influence on, who the black freedom struggle had a huge influence on, this whole notion of the right to compete, of this whole Lincoln-esque idea that those of us uh, who are in America have the right to rise as far as our talents will take us, it undergirds the entire struggle of my life, of my people, and my history. Chris in his book is saying that there's something wrong with that, or there might be something wrong with that, the whole idea of the meritocracy. And so I just want to start this conversation off with this beautiful quote, which I think encapsulates a good part of uh, his book. The iron law of meritocracy states that eventually the inequality produced by a meritocratic system will grow large enough to subvert the mechanisms of mobility. Unequal outcomes make equal opportunity impossible. The principle of deference will come to overwhelm the principle of mobility. Those who are able to climb up the, of the ladder and will find ways to pull it up after them or to selectively lower it down to allow their friends, allies, kin to scramble up. In other words, whosoever says meritocracy says oligarchy. Chris, you want to explain that? <laughs> Um, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thanks for everyone for coming out. Thank you for your patience. I'm sorry uh, that if, if it was a little bit of a cluster flock outside. Flock? Um, yes, I'm used to television, so I get that. Um, um, I said that on the air once, and I heard my producers gasp in my ear. I said flock. I said flock. <laughs> Don't worry. I got it. I got it. I got it. Um, uh, and thank you. Uh, to, so thanks everyone for having me, and thank you, Tanahazi, for having me up. Um, and thanks for the very kind words about the book. Um, so that that section is a is actually 
there's a context for that quote that maybe might be helpful. Right. Uh, and it's a it's a, a fascinating, fascinating social theorist who I stumbled upon in, in working on the book and who's who has been a bit lost, I think, to history. His name is Robert Michels. People familiar with Robert Michels? We're on the camp. Yeah, see? Not many. <laughs> and I had never heard of the guy before. Um, he was a German. He was a star student of Weber's, and um, he was uh, he was a lefty. At a time when there was this roiling uh, upheaval of democratic revolutions spanning across uh, Europe. And he was very active with the Social Democratic Party in Germany, and then he got tired with them and he moved to the kind of more anarcho syndicalist lefties. And he writes this book in 1915 called Political Parties, in which he basically takes upon this problem. He says, Here's this weird thing about the way German politics work. The parties of the right, which are anti-democratic in their ideological commitments and are hierarchical in how they believe the world should be ordered, it is not surprising that they are hierarchical, that they are anti-democratic. But the parties of the German left that believe in democracy and believe in sort of bottom-up governance, hmm. yet they do not reflect that in their structure. Hmm. They are every bit as hierarchical and as captured by a small elite as the right-wing parties. And why is that? And he coins this term in the book Political Parties, which I am sort of paying some tribute to, called the Iron Law of Oligarchy. And what he says is, oligarchy is inherent in any system of organization. That essentially any system of organization, no matter how intense the democratic aspirations of it, need to, for pure logistical reasons, concentrate certain purposes, certain tasks, in a small amount of people, right? right. And if you have ever worked in a group setting, you see how this works, right? Everyone, everyone, this, this has some resonance, right? Someone is the one who's like, oh, I'll do that. Oh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll put the schedule together, right? And the person who controls the schedule controls the destiny of the organization, right? The person that controls the party press, the person that is the person who opens up the union hall, right? And lords over the union hall hours. And so there's this concentration. He says, he basically says, this is an inevitable iron law of human organization. Whoever says organization says oligarchy. Now, from the perspective of the democratic left, this is an incredibly depressing conclusion. <laughs> Because it basically says, it doesn't matter your utopian schemes for genuine diffusion of power in your trade labor associations. You will end up recreating oligarchy no matter what you do. Mm. And at the end of the book, there is this very beautiful passage where he basically says, so what, 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 what do we do with this conclusion I've come to that we're, that this is all, we're all screwed? <laughs> and he basically says, well, he says, democracy... Um, Democracy can be compared to the following fable, which is an old man who tells his peasant sons that he has buried treasure on their land and then dies. And the three sons search the land for that treasure, and they plow the fields, and they dig up everything looking for that treasure, and they never find it because the treasure does not exist. But in plowing the fields, they increase the fertility of the soil and secure for themselves a relative well-being. Democracy, Michelle says, is the treasure we may never find, by, but the struggle to achieve it will produce for us a relative bounty. See, I, I have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a lie, though. Right. I mean, it's still a lie. I mean, how do, you, how do we go out and pitch that and say, well, you know, this is a lie, but good things come from the lie. So, so Michelle's basically is with you. Because after he writes that, he decides that the only way to genuinely channel something that looks like mass opinion democracy is through the figurehead of a single charismatic leader, mm -hmm. Benito Mussolini, and he becomes a fascist. <laughs> he is a right wing pet right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he basically throws in the towel and becomes a fascist, literally. <laughs> um, this is very depressing for the left. Yes. So, so the, the parallel here, I think, to meritocracy, right, is... <laughs> Is there some, so basically I'm saying in the book that the, the setup where we say we're going to neatly divide a quality of opportunity and a quality of outcome, right? This is, the, this is our sort of framework that we're not going to say, oh, everyone gets the same income or everyone gets some basic bedrock set of rights, um, economic rights, not, 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 not civil rights. Um, <laughs> That, that basically we're going to have this level playing field and people could compete and sort of the chips fall where they may, that that is going to lead to oligarchy. Mm -hmm. That system will become corrupted because the people that win in that system, those equality of outcomes, will subvert the attempts to provide equality of opportunity. And then the question becomes, which gets to the really profound core of this is, is the system redeemable, right? right? Do right. you end up in the same place 
with respect to meritocracy, if you buy my analysis, that Michelle's ended up with respect to democracy in his first incarnation, or well, where Michelle's ended up with democracy in his second incarnation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to make this like really, really concrete, uh, you know, again, as a, as a pinko, commie, Islamo fascist, uh, <laughs> plotting the end, taking your guns and your religion and whatever else I can get my hands on. Um, <laughs> the most racing aspect of the book actually for me was you get into this point where Chris is outlining uh, basically, it's almost like a genealogy, I would say, of the Obama administration. And you can basically throw a pebble and hit a millionaire. Right. To the extent that it's almost hard to evade the conclusion that you have to be a millionaire to work here. I mean, you're going through chiefs of staff. The quote is too long. I, I won't, you know, read it out loud. How do we feel about that? How are we supposed to? I mean, these are supposed to be your progressives. Yeah. I mean, where, do you, where, where does that leave us? I think it leaves us in a bad place. <laughs> right. And I think one of the things that that passage you're talking about where I just sort can of. I, I'm sorry. Can I just walk that yeah, back please, a little bit, please. Chris? How do we even get, how right. do we even get into a situation where it seems like to work you know, uh, in any sort of senior position in the Obama White House, you have to be wealthy. How do we even get there? So we get there because there is a a kind of um, circular economy around different kinds of power in which one form can be traded for others. Mm -hmm. So if you think about power, um, the, 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 the categories I, and again, if, if there's any actual genuine social scientists in the audience, and I suspect there are, just, you know, excuse the kind of amateur grappling <laughs> that I'm doing here. I'm like We're gonna slightly, in, minutes. You slightly take embarrassed in front of academic <laughs> audiences who have thought about this for hundreds of years. But um, uh, so, so, so just to for, forgive me my little like kitchen hobby sociology here. Um, <laughs> So the, the three types of power I talk about in the book is, 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 is um, money, platform, and networks. Mm -hmm. And platform is roughly how many people you can reach. Networks is who do you know, and money is how much money do you have. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things we see, and I saw in reporting for Washington, is how easily one who does not have money can monetize one's networks. Mm -hmm and how much one who does have money can purchase access to those networks. Mm -hmm. Now we call this, we have a shortcut for that term called the revolving door. Mm -hmm. And we think of it as something that this bad thing that nefarious people do, but it's actually just the fact of the matter of the nature of elite connections at a certain level, which is that if you have enough connections and you're not making a lot of money at a certain point, you're doing something wrong, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when Robert Gibbs leaves the White House, right? who someone who has worked as the, the, the press secretary right. and wasn't a millionaire, right. right? The question just becomes, where will his payout be? Right. And the thing that he is selling, the payout is in exchange for the network power that he has. Right. Similarly, if you are an oil company who wants to rig some certain piece of legislation, what you do is you pay money to have access to the networks. Mm -hmm. Who are you paying, Chris? You're paying just to make this lobbying firms and okay. law firms. Okay. Um, okay. So what you see is that if you have these different... And Gibbs is giving access to who? Is he give, is, you can talk to the president? I mean, is it that simple and crude? Or what is it more like? How does it work? So there's a study done. Here's a great example of this. Okay. To, to actually bring in some genuinely rigorous social science. Okay. Um, <laughs> there was an amazing study done. And it looked at staffers who had left the Hill. Okay who went to work at lobbying firms, and it looked at their salaries. And it looked at, it was a discontinuity study, it looked at what happened to their salaries after their former boss, who was a chairman of a committee, left the chair. And their salaries go down. So what are we to conclude there? Yeah. That they are being paid for access to the chair of the committee, and when they no longer have access to the chair of the committee, but just a member of the committee, the market, the labor market prices that in accordingly. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it works. I mean, th that's a very like concrete example of what this looks like. Mm -hmm. And what you see is at the up at the sort of height, the highest echelons of this, that there's this just easy movement. And you've been to, you've been to Aspen. You right. and I were talking about this right. on the walk over here, right? right? Like right. the Aspen Ideas Festival. Right. You're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, no, because it's no, it's, sorry, I'm it's just a sociolo it's a right. sociological fact that you basically have this very easy traffic between different elite centers of power. Right. Right. And so, and the just, I just want to yeah, clarify please. this yeah. point too, because one of the things that I 
the Atlantic, my employer, does an Aspen Ideas Festival every year. And one of the things that I did not know, having toiled away as a writer at that point, about 12 years for the first time I went, is that people who, will, who are rich will pay to be in the vicinity of people who are smart. <laughs> and I didn't, like, I'd like to read Chris's book. I'm not going to pay $7,000 to have. I love Chris, too. But that, that happens. Right. Like that, I, it was a total shock to me. And that, in some ways, is the most benign version of right. this, right? Because right. that's actually just like... That's actually just kind of purchasing a consumption good, which is like, I like to be around people saying interesting things. Except that I kind of believe if you're having dinner with that person, it can't, I mean, right. then, that's where you get right. to this. And, it, you know, getting, thinking about this rigorously, I think is difficult. But what you end up with in a situation is the proximity that a member, a given member of the elite has to other members of the elite. And this is almost definitional, but I'll say it anyway, is so much closer than they have to the masses, right? And this funneling effect acts on people who even come from the most community organizer, small D That's democratic right. backgrounds, That's right? right? That's right. So when you look at who is around Barack Obama, the former community organizer, it's, you know, Rahm Emanuel, who <laughs> was a fundraiser for Mayor Daley, went to the White House, uses White House collect connections to have a cash out at an investment banking firm where he made $60 million in one year mm -hmm. putting together a deal. Mm -hmm. Now, the guy had no finance background. <laughs> There's no reason to hire him right. for fi a finance job, right? right? The only thing that he had was he'd been in the White House for right. years. He goes, he cashes out, he makes all this money. Then he you know, goes back into public service. He runs for Congress, chief of staff. David Axelrod, who I have a lot of admiration for as a political thinker, but is a multimillionaire from this you know, firm he has. You know, um, Larry Summers was making, what was he making? Like $100,000 a week from D.E. Shaw yeah. for like essentially just to like throw a few emails their way once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, those, th these payouts are very, they're very insidiously corrupting, right? Because everybody, the point is that, and this these is are not quote unquote bad people. They're not bad yeah. people. And, and, and whether they are bad or not is sort of beside the point. Right. The point is that every, you will end up in the 1%. Right. Right. That's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> right. Right. So one of the, the reasons I so, and I assigned Chris's book to my, my kids in my class. And the main reason I wanted them to read this is MIT is one of the largest breeders of the elite. And so, I love MIT, but it's true. I'm sure you guys are very proud of that fact. It's probably part of the pitch, right? Um, and Cambridge itself. Totally. I mean, I got, when I put this on the blog, first comment is really ironic right. that you're going to have this in Cambridge to talk about the elite. But I thought, what, what better other place to have it? You know, uh, you take it right here. And so, uh, one of the points that you make in your, in your book is that this sort of, can I call it almost incestuous relationship? When you're around the same people over and over again, it actually creates a worse elite. That one of the points you're making is, can I say we're going to have an elite, right? right. Am I right about that? Yeah. And you are invested in us having a high quality elite, and that this you know sort of relationship uh, dilutes that. So I wanted you to talk some about that. I know yeah. uh, of all people, David Frum made this point on Morning Joe. David Frum, and you know, he, Frum is coming from the right. right, and he said, look. We're all on TV. What are we talking about? We're talking about the deficit, right? This means a lot to us. You know, all of us, we don't have to worry about our health insurance. Right. We're fine. Are we talking about poverty? No. Why aren't we? Right. Yeah, so there's a um, – I'm not quite sure – let me say that I'm not quite sure – I think there's some ambiguity in the book, and it's an ambiguity that um, reviewers have picked up on Okay. between my commitment to – Getting rid of the elite or my <laughs> commitment to um, improving it. Improving it. Um, David Brooks thinks I'm a Jacobin, basically. Right. Um, so like, are you like he literally called me a Jacobin right. in his column. But you'll take that, David Brooks. Yeah, and, right? and, 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 and in, a, in a really sort of wonderful and scathing review in a, a, a lefty publication, New Inquiry, a guy named Freddy DeBoer, who's a fantastic writer, basically. Accuse me of being David Brooks. Right. right. <laughs> um, by Washington logic, that means you're right. Right, that's right, you're exactly. Right. I'm Therefore, getting it from right. both sides. Therefore, exactly. You're a genius. Um, <laughs> so I think, I think there's some ambiguity, and I think, yes, I think. The, but where are you then? I mean, have you not figured this out? I mean, where, where are you? Are you a Jacobin? I really go back and forth. Like, I, I, I do think that I, there's some unsettled ambiguity on this, and part of this is 
is the complicated emotional psychological fact of the fact that I am produced by these institutions, mm. right? Mm. So, you know, it drives me crazy. Like I was, I remember being at, a, at a, an event at Heritage where Dick Army, Dick Army, in a ten-gallon cowboy hat and cowboy boots, literally, <laughs> like, like, I am one of you costume. <laughs> <laughs> Taught was railing about the elite. And it's like, bro, <laughs> who are you kidding? Right. Right. And so, and so I, I guess I, I want to be very explicit about the, the fact that, you know, I'm, I was produced by these meritocratic institutions and there is some vestigial mm. affection mm. for them mm. that, that comes, that is the, that is the sort of affection of familial right. knowledge. Right. Um, but I do think that the current system of meritocracy and the accelerating radical inequality it produces. Mm -hmm. When we talk about it, our critique, particularly on the left, tends to be a critique about why it's bad for people on the bottom of the social hierarchy, mm -hmm. right? Which mm -hmm. is that, you know, we don't care, we don't do anything about poverty. Right. And it's unjust, and we have stagnating wages and declining personal incomes, and I can list off the statistics for a while. And the argument the book makes is that one of the worst things about it is that it makes the people on the top worse. Hmm. And it makes the people on the top worse because it produces psychopathologies that are very destructive. Mm -hmm. And it, it malforms people. And it also produces cognitive blind spots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the best example of this to me is the Federal Reserve and the housing bubble. And the term I use in the book to talk about it is social distance. So around... Uh, there's a place I talk about in the book called the Center for Responsible Lending in Raleigh-Durham. And they do work around predatory lending. And they had this experience in which the founder, they, they basically are also a community finance group, so they make loans and whatever. The founder had this experience where a guy walks in, the, walks in in 2002 or 2003 and basically says, I'm going to lose my home that I've owned outright. This guy's a widower with a daughter, lost his wife and had a second a home equity loan at a teaser rate. You guys familiar with the, how this sort of con worked, right? Teaser rate, balloon payment. When the balloon payment comes, which is when the rate goes up, you can't afford it. But as long as home prices keep going up, you can refinance at that moment, which seems like a good deal, except every refinance comes with fees. And those fees are actually getting at the equity. So every refinance is stripping equity. And if you go through four refinancing on a house that's worth $40,000 in a working class neighborhood of Raleigh-Durham, it just takes four refinancing until there's no equity in the house left and you're going to get foreclosed on. And he says, I'm basically losing my home. And Center for Responsible Lending starts looking into this and they're like, oh my God, the mortgage market is bananas. And they start writing papers along with the Green Lighting Institute saying the mortgage market is totally fraudulent, destructive, predatory, gonna blow up, gonna blow up, gonna blow up. Meanwhile, Alan Greenspan, things seem totally fine in the mortgage market. Ben Bernanke, things are totally fine in the mortgage market. And to me, the illustration of this is that no amount of charts and graphs presented to you in an airless boardroom mm. about the mortgage market mm. is gonna affect you the way that the guy showing up in your office in tears because he's gonna lose his home and that he and his daughter live in is going to affect you. Right. And to the extent that we create an elite who can exist entirely in a world in which they will never pass a foreclosed home in their neighborhood, then foreclosure won't be dealt with. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that I like uh, about the book I enjoyed is we're obviously are spending a lot of time talking about politics. Uh, you know, we'll spend more time talking about it. But you can see it actually broadens out way beyond that. Uh, Chris has a whole chapter on baseball and the steroid scandal and what that means. The Catholic Church. Uh, what is the mechanism by which something that you're analyzing in a government filters out into the entire culture, into baseball, into the Catholic Church? What, where's the commonality? Where's the thread? So I think there's two commonalities. Uh, so in the case of the Catholic Church, I think the commonality is this. And I'm sorry, I just, were you raised Catholic? I was. Okay, all right. Not only was I raised Catholic, actually. So my father was a Jesuit seminarian. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't even want to begin to interpret that gas. <laughs> the worst part is it went through the whole world. It just rumbled like, upwards. Just shined, it was like a wave. Like a wave. <laughs> my, father was a, my father was a Jesuit seminarian and met my mom uh, 
in the Bronx when he was at Fordham University with his Jesuit cohort who had rented an apartment in the floor above the apartment that my mom, her two sisters, and her family had grown up in on Marion Avenue in the Bronx. Um, and he was at that point had become very radicalized and was doing a lot of community organizing. And I think he says his story to this day was that he was going to leave the priesthood. He was thinking of leaving before he met my mom, but that pushed him over. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I grew up in the church and and have very conflicted feelings about the church. Right. Um, so so I guess let me say two things. One is the story of the church is not a story about meritocracy because. Lord knows the Catholic Church is not a meritocracy and does not pretend to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an ancient patriarchy. It's, mm -hmm. in fact, the model for a patriarchy. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is the, the or patriarchy. Um, and, and, but to me, when you look at the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church scandal, the, it, the, the scandal is not that there were pedophiles in the priesthood. Any sufficiently large population of, of men, particularly, will have predators. Right. The scandal is not even, to be totally honest, or that this massive institution covered up the crimes of the people in it. Because as much as one would expect better of a religious institution, institutional prerogatives of self-preservation are intense. Mm -hmm. The scandal is the fact that the bishops would be told about these predators and not just take them away from the kids. Mm. That they would transfer them or whatever. That they would continue to put them in places. They, they, they could have just found somewhere to, for them to go that they never saw another kid again. And there's this really amazing moment in which, in a Times article that I quote in the piece, that captures this, which is a Belgian sex abuse survivor with his uncle, the priest, who abused him in a room in a meeting with the bishop, the three of them. And the survivor is filled with rage and hurt. And he, he is being told by the bishop not to report the crime because his uncle is very close to retirement anyway. So just kind of let him go off the sunset in peace. And the victim, the survivor says, why do you feel sorry for him and not me? Why is the empathy directed towards the predator and not to the preyed upon? Mm -hmm. And that is the, that when you drill down past everything in the church, you get to this fundamental question. And the answer to it, I think, inevitably is social distance. Mm -hmm. It is the inevitable consequence of creating what is quite literally, again, the model of a cosseted elite mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who do not have the empathic ability to put themselves in the shoes of the parent who's sending their child off to church and, and, and to parochial school. And that the inevitable consequence of that level of social distance is genuine evil. Genuine evil. Now, that's, that's the church. Right. In the case of baseball... The connection is something else, and it has to do with meritocracies. And maybe I'll talk about that, that, and then I'll shut up for a little bit. Okay. I'm talking a lot. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Just interrupt me. Okay. No, like no, we're on my I, show. I think you have them wrapped. So I don't... <laughs> Chris usually, uh, I've been lucky enough to be on Chris's show, and so uh, he usually gets to uh, interview me. I'm, I'm kind of relishing having him have to carry this. Okay. Okay. Um, but no, I do. I do want to. One thing. I, we can't stop at the Catholic Church because the one commonality I do see there is uh, a kind of callousness to people whom you are not around. And Chris, I'm yes, sorry, I can't exactly. remember this, but do you, do you take on the press at all in this book? A, a little bit, a little bit. I, okay. I talk, but they're not, they don't become a huge focus, but I do think the fact that the, the kind of professionalization of journalism right, right. And, and the kind of class reproduction of the internship program right, right. Pr has the same effect. Right, right, right. Has the same effect. Just a, just a quick note, one of the, the I repeat, Constantly, constantly. I'm studying French. I want to say constamment. <laughs> <laughs> love that. I and love, that. I I love that you're studying French. <laughs> it's going to take me like 10 years. My favorite thing. Uh, one of the things that happens is always say, Tana Heise, it's very nice that you're at the Atlantic. How do you do that? You know? And why, why is this happening at you know, other places? Why you know, is the press away? Why is it? And what happens is there's kind of this notion of a conspiracy theory or whatever they you know, want to keep us out. In fact, it's just, well, 
it's just well, especially at the magazines, um, you have to take uh, an internship. Those internships, until relatively recently, until relatively recently, were not paid. Uh, you had to have certain backers. There's only a certain sort of person who can live in New York City for a year, summer, whatever, uh, and not, you know, take a, a take a paycheck. Uh, the New York Times, I think this is less so now, but somebody was just talking to me about this yesterday. Used to specifically draw basically from the Ivy League, so there was a whole connection sort yep. of angle. The pathways in are just so narrow. And if you were like me, I got lucky, but if you're like me, if you're a kid who grew up in West Baltimore, went to public school, went to college, God forbid you dropped out of college like I did, uh, you tend not to even know where to begin, where to start, where to go. The thing, the reason why I think this has a relation to your, uh, your book is because what you end up is a group of people who may well know each other from college. If they don't know each other from college, they come from a particular social class. Yep. Uh, they have that sort of commonality there. They are, if you're in, if you're doing White House re reporting, they are around each other constantly. And this is the funnel through which we get our politics. And I just, you know, I, you talk about social distance. I mean, I have totally. a lot of, you know, social closeness to the president, to the people who are around the president, to powerful people, to this whole class of millionaires yep. that you're talking about. I have very little yep. social intimacy. Uh, to God forbid, poor people. I mean, yeah, working people, yeah. whatever. And you're not going to live around. I mean, I don't live there, so... Right. No, I mean, that's that's spot on. I think right. it's 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 pernicious, and I think it. So the very people, just the, yeah. the very people who would be a check on this, right? Are in fact part of it. I'm holding. Yeah, particularly in our political culture. Yes. Although the one thing I would say to push back on that is, I do think, and may, and this is going to sound maybe naively romantic, but I do think that reporting done correctly is one of the few ways to attack head on the problem of social distance because a genuinely good reporter really does listen first mm -hmm. and I think the thing that I love most about being a reporter the thing I love most about being a reporter now although I don't get to do as much reporting as I used to mm -hmm. would be that I could go into worlds that I didn't have any social connection to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just go there and ask people what's going on mm -hmm and try to, as faithfully as possible, tease out what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so good reporting is actually one of the ways that we should, that we can bridge it, or at least we can try to deal with this right. problem. Right. Um, but the, but the, the specific class origins of the American press is a huge- Wait, I just want to stop you yeah. but what happens if we end up listening to the same people over years, over and over again? <laughs> then you get what we got. Mm -hmm. Then you get what we got. Right. And I think that's, <laughs> I mean, and what I mean by what we got was Iraq reporting, That's housing right. bubble That's reporting. Right. That's right. That's right. And there's this capture problem. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this cognitive capture problem, which is that, you know, when you, if you spend all your time reporting on people on Wall Street, mm -hmm. like, they're not idiots, the people on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of them are, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> some of them really are. But, but a lot of them are. not They're extremely smart people. And if you just spend all your time talking to them, like, it just chips away at you. Mm -hmm. You start, mm -hmm. they start to sound persuasive. Mm -hmm. Like there are, the question is who are you close to and who are you distant from? Right, right. One, one of the things I want to ask you about, I'm going to tell a personal story and I should not tell this, but I'm going to, um, I'm going to write about this one day. It has to do with money, my money, um, <laughs> tax money. Um, if you decide and I hope some of you in this room uh, will decide. If you decide that you want to be a writer of any sort, no matter what you come from, um, you will find that uh, movement across tax brackets through a series of years is not an uncommon experience. Um, so if you're like me, you will have years where you made $1,000 that year. That's just what happened. Uh, the dream is that you'll practice it well and maybe you make a stable living and things get better, things get better. Uh, I have been lucky enough that things got a little better, a little better. They got better enough that I looked at my taxes differently. Now, I didn't, you know, say I don't want to pay taxes. But what it did do was it put into relief in a way that it couldn't have, let's say, 10 years ago, 
what Mitt Romney's tax rate actually was and what he really was doing. It really, you know, in a way that I just couldn't understand on those years I made, you know, 1,000, 2,000, even 10,000, 20. Right. I just couldn't understand it until I saw it. And I think one of the most interesting things is the people who are most likely to be critical are actually like you actually come from, you know, the institutions of their time. They come from it. They are of the elite. Malcolm X has this uh, speech, which I love Malcolm X, but I, I always think it's dead wrong. Where he tries to contrast the field slave and the house slave. He didn't say slave. He used a totally different word uh, that we won't use here at MIT. Uh, <laughs> you can Google it. Right, you can Google it. <laughs> right. right. But the notion is that somehow if you are in the field, if you are down, you somehow have, you know, some, you are better able to critique what it is, and so I guess I want to challenge right. This you. is this is interesting, right? So right. this is exactly the same right. insight, the right. kind of distance. Yes, yes. Except proximity allows you to see things too right. that maybe you couldn't see at, at distance either. Well, so that's I, you know, like I always tell people, the Haitian Revolution, right? Most successful, I think, the only successful slave uh, rebellion, certainly in the Western Hemisphere, was led by Toussaint. You know, well treated. Right. You know, uh, right. slave, very very educated. You know, Matt Turner, when they interview, they say I was very well treated. Denmark Vesey plotted this giant slave rebellion in South Carolina. It was free African American. You know, these are not people who right, were you know, right. totally in the. Well, know. so that that I mean, there's there's two things I'd say here. One is there's a chapter in the book which is about how we get the knowledge we get, mm -hmm. and I do think that I talk about these kind of three uh, shortcuts or heuristics mm -hmm. uh, that we use to 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 figure out what we know. And one of them is proximity. One mm -hmm. of them, that's one of our rules of thumb, which is you want to hear it from someone as close to the source as possible. Right. Right. So it's like. And, and one of the, the crushing and devastating betrayals of the failed decade, as I call it in the book, is that that proved to be a pretty crappy way to learn about the world. Mm. Because a lot of the people who were closest to the manufacturing of the Death Star machine that was the securitization uh, machinery of, of Wall Street were the most blind to its consequences. Mm. And the people at the periphery were the ones who, who saw it first. And it's also true about the people who had, quote, the best access to reporting on intelligence in Iraq, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? The people with the, the closest, the proximity. Mm -hmm. But then the, this question about a radicalized sector that is very close to the people right. at the top, right. I think is very right on. And it's something I write in the book and also have taken some flack for, um, is the idea that in some ways the, the most radicalized class in America over the last 10 years mm -hmm. is the upper middle class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not because they have it worse because they don't. Right, right. But because the the experience of deindustrialization de and poverty that was the norm in the 80s and 90s, although sort of lifted a little bit in the 90s, meant that, and I, this is people things people have told me in the west side of Chicago or in San Antonio or in New Orleans, that like, yeah, the last decade was bad, but so were the 90s and so were the 80s, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. The people, I think, who feel the last decade as a kind of radical disjuncture and discontinuity and betrayal the most are the people who do have a relative amount of privilege, mm -hmm. who are who had faith in the system mm -hmm. that is now repaying them with mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that is a predicate for radicalization. Yeah, I think also the other thing is we can't discount, uh, I think, the notion that, and this is, you know, coming out of this whole idea of meritocracy, if you were rich, you necessarily worked hard. It's just true. You necessarily work on it. And then all sorts of moral judgments come totally. with that. And if you have no direct access to rich people, I would argue it's very easy to buy that yourself um, and to you know internalize that. Even as you may be critiquing it, I just speak only for myself, I'll say that once you get close to it, it is shocking how human people actually are. Oh, absolutely. The board, the and, there's, and, and one of the things that's really fascinating about this our elite and the meritocratic elite that's different from other elites mm -hmm. is that because the story of elite formation is a story of overcoming and a story of social mobility, the people are then as a, almost a kind of ritual of entrance into the elite to construct for themselves their own story of overcoming, right. their own story of mobility, even when manifestly ridiculous. Right. Right. So the best example of this is Mitt Romney, mm -hmm. <laughs> who got up at a presidential debate and it was a primary debate, not in the general. And, and basically said, look, um, you know, I, I could have inherited the car company, but I struck out on my own. <laughs> These are his terms, struck out on his own. He came here to Cambridge where he, got a, he went to Harvard Law School <laughs> and Harvard, Harvard Business Law School. School. <laughs> and, 
And then he, and then, and, and Ann Romney had gave this, gave this notorious interview to the Boston Globe, actually, I think it, it wasn't during this campaign, although it resurfaced, where she talked about their years in BYU and the hardship they faced, in which she talks about stapling squares of carpet sample to the floor, and when times got tough, having to sell some of Mitt Romney's inherited stock <laughs> right, right, to make ends meet. Now, that's odd. <laughs> yeah, that's ridiculous. You can laugh. <laughs> that's ridiculous. But it's very genuinely felt. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that is one of the kind of psychopathologies I think that the current meritocratic elite produces is that because we have what I call the book Fractal Inequality, which is everyone always has someone just above them who's making more money or has more status. And that goes on like, like a kind of M.C. Escher drawing ever upwards. And what you're saying by a fact, like the factor actually increases yeah, too. Exactly. The distance like, actually increases that the, as that the, Basically, the relationship, like the 1% has the same relationship to the top 10th of 1% as the top 10th of 1% has to the top 100th of 1%, right. which is that the distribution skews and skews and skews like that. Right. Well, from yeah. your perspective like that. <laughs> and, and, and so what that does is you never feel... You always feel under siege. Mm. You, you never feel, there is no space even for something that would look like noblesse oblige. Mm -hmm. Because you, even though you are an overlord, you are convinced you are a scrappy underdog. Mm -hmm. And this is true of people, like if you ever read a Roger Ailes profile, this is one of the most powerful right. people in America. Right. And he genuinely thinks that like he is under siege, that there's some elites somewhere out there. Like, he, if, if anyone is an elite, it's Roger Ayers. Right. right. So, I, I two questions, and then I think we should open it up, right, Tom? Is that how time is going? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. You have time. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to filibuster that. I have my memoir here, which I will begin reading. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should all read it. It's yeah. great. Hustle my own book here. Um, so, one of the things I, I, I wonder is how much of this is about what the American idea is of being rich, of making it. And I think, again, speaking from my own experience, looking at how it's projected out to us, it is the absence of work, mm -hmm. which actually never, I don't think, really happens. Um, you know, if I may give some credit, it, it was a, um, a profile in New Yorker, maybe about two months ago, the billionaires were going after Obama. And the guy was basically illustrating the pathology you just outlined. Now, just to take his defense, He's waking up at like five in the morning. Right. You know, he's at the office all out. He's working. Right. And his argument is, I work hard. Right. I work hard. You know. Um, and I wonder if that has, you know, something to do with the inability to see himself as having done it. Totally. You know? I mean, like he's not royalty in his mind. I'm not, you know, Prince Charles. Or no, whatever, this is know, true. From and this, this partly this has to do with a really interesting political economic fact, which is about the nature of the one percent moving from essentially a rentier class to a wage earning class, mm -hmm. right? So like the people at hedge funds who are in the 1%, um, you know, they're, they are, that's, that's their wage. I mean, they call it carried interest, so, but it's not really, that's their <laughs> wage. If they pay 15% on it, but they're not, a lot of them are not the idle rich as we would think of them, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and I think Americans, our, our, our relationship to work and working hard, I think, is a very under-interrogated thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, it's really fascinating to go back and read political and economic theorists in the late 19th century around the Industrial Revolution. Keynes wrote about this uh, as recently as the 30s. And the Jetsons. Go back and watch the Jetsons. <laughs> There was a broad consensus for a long period in intellectual history that the problem humans would face is what to do with all their leisure time. Mm. Mm. Because obviously the surplus of capitalism and technology would produce everything we needed without having to work. And in the Jetsons, they work like seven hours a week. Mm. George works like seven hours a week. Of course, there's no like feminist revolution in the future of the Jetsons <laughs> either. Obviously, it's very... Um, but, and, and Marx, you know, Marx has this very beautiful passage in, in I think it's in Capital when he writes uh -oh. about, uh -oh. <laughs> you know, he writes about this sort of his ideal being 
essentially in a weird way the kind of abolition of work and the, mm. and the full flourishing of hum, humanity in which every man could be a, a fish it was a fisher in the morning and a poet mm. in the afternoon mm. as his soul so desires mm. um that, that that you would work a little and then you'd maybe do like your watercolors mm. and you would and and it's funny that that seems ridiculous to us now that that, that was actually the chief aspiration for so much of the intellectual history of the development of capitalism mm -hmm. was that the thing that this was all driving towards was freedom from work. And now we just realize that's ridiculous and in fact we're just all working more. Yeah. Yeah. And there are other places where in Europe for instance they have taken much more of a leisure. They have made the choice essentially to take that, that surplus in leisure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to like, I mean, obviously, like, I work very hard, and I think there's great dignity in working hard. But, you know, this economist said to me once something that has haunted me ever since, where he said, time is the only resource they're never making That's any right. more of. That's right. And he said, you could always, not always, but he says, you can, you can borrow money and you can't borrow time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, not to get too morbid here but like this is all we got at least for my right. my particular worldview i'm right. sure people in the audience don't think that right. um but from where i sit like this is what we have yeah. and you know i think everyone deserves the right to both fulfilling work mm -hmm. work that genuinely has both dignity that pays them a good wage but also like dignity and wages are, are only part of it because happiness comes from doing something that brings the fulfillment that there is some connection between effort and reward, that you are seen as a full person, that your ideas and inputs are a manifestation in some sense of who you are. Mm -hmm. And I and now I'm sounding preposterously utopian, but right. I think that everyone deserves that. Right. You know who does watercolors, fun fact? You know this? I know two people that do watercolors. Okay, so I'm going to see if you can guess what I'm thinking about. Go Paul ahead. Bremer. Paul Bremer. Paul Bremer does watercolors. Has a website. <laughs> Paul Bremer said, I'm done. I want to talk about watercolors. And now George W. Bush is doing that. Are you serious? <laughs> I'll resist the kind of out, out, down spot uh, right, joke. Right, 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 right. You know, I, I think also, I just want to go back to that Mitt Romney story you told, because I think one of the things that people do not understand, this is very, very hard to get across to people, is even if Mitt had no money at all, even if Mitt really did strike on, out on his own, got no help, had to sell all of his stock options, <laughs> as an African American, when they study race, they always want to compare income. So they say, this white family over here right. is making this, this black family is making over this, the black family still lacks. Clearly, there's something right. cultural. But there's no sense of social network. Totally. Mitt Romney knows people that uh, Mitchell Jenkins does not. Right. You know what I mean? Right. He has connections. Right. That, you know, this guy over here, it doesn't matter. Right. Like, you can strip them naked. You can take everything from them. Right. He's going to be able to call somebody. Totally. This other person over here is not. And I often, why, how do we put that into our political dialogue? There's no sense of that at all. No, there's zero sense of that, and, and, and the reason there's zero sense of that is because we have this kind of formalistic vision mm. of equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. This formalistic vision is the level playing field, mm -hmm. right? And the level playing field just writes out and erases so much. Mm -hmm. And it erases, it just doesn't, there is no conversation about privilege in mainstream American right. discourse, right? There's a conversation. It's like wrong, it's like shaming, or like to even bring no, it up. No, because all, all we will, what we will talk about is its inverse, which is disadvantage. Right, right. Right. which is less dangerous. Right. So we will talk about disadvantaged youth. Right. We will talk about poor schools and poor kids, and isn't it so poor that they're so poor? Right. <laughs> and what can we do? How can we bust the teachers union so that they can do better on their right. tests? Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I'm letting my politics show there a little bit. Right, I, right, right. It's a complicated issue, I will grant. Well, just, I mean, again, to show how this over, you know, overlaps with race, one of the things I always think about is throughout the campaign, Obama, show us your... Birth certificate, I show you my birth certificate. Show me your college grades. Oh my show God. Show me this, show yeah. me that. And it would have went on and on and on, no doubt. Um, Mitt Romney is from a neighborhood uh, in Detroit called Palmer Woods. I had the deep pleasure of reporting on Palmer Woods in Detroit. He was born there in, uh, I think, uh, 1947. Mitt Romney was born into segregation. If you look at the deeds on the houses from Palmer Woods from that period, they say, no black people here. No, there might be no Jews too, but definitely no black people here who do not work here. They made an exemption for living maids who do not work here. He 
He was born into a right to not have to compete. Right. Into a broad affirmative action across the city, across the society, on every level. Nobody looks at Mitt Romney and says, well, show us how you got here. Right. You know, no sort of inverse uh, critique of that at all. One last question, and then I want to open it up for, for the audience. Um, I want to challenge you on something that I think about all the time. Um, well, no, I'm not going to do that. You know what I want to do? This is your audience. This is the elite. We got a lot of MIT kids, especially uh, to the front. What do you have to say to them? What's their responsibility? That's a great question. Um, this, again, this sounds... I'm doing that thing where I'm critiquing what I'm going to say before I say it, so maybe I'll just say it. I'm like writing the critique of it before I say it. <laughs> you have an obligation, if you have privilege, to do something that is going to make the world more just and equitable. You have a moral obligation to do that. I believe that with every fiber of my being, and I think part of the insidiousness of this kind of meritocratic rat race is you convince yourself that you're just another striver and like you got to get on your grind and get on your hustle so you can win this kind of race and I think that the system we have cultivates that instinct and kills the instinct in people that you genuinely if you if you have been if you have won the birth lottery enough to be granted privilege and that privilege I mean in a broad Rawlsian sense which is to say the privilege of having a quick mind or the privilege of testing well mm. or the privilege of having a compelling personality mm. or the privilege of being very, very good at doing math along with the privilege of the color of your skin, the privilege of the neighborhood you grew mm. up in and the privilege of the educational endowment that you were granted. All of those privileges confer a genuine moral duty and responsibility to do something to make the world more just. Mm. Mm. Here, here. Yeah. Uh, so... I just saw uh, the new Spider-Man movie this weekend. Great power, great responsibility. Great power, great responsibility. Great power, great responsibility. Let's open it up uh, for some questions. I beg of you to stay to questions. Think about it like this. The more questions you ask as opposed to statements, the more people in this room can get in questions. So let's be fair to everybody. Uh, I saw a hand all the way in the back uh, with the glass. There you go. Yes, you. Uh, all right, so i got to cut mine down to a question. Thank you. Um, but So Tom Ricks writes the book, The Generals. Yes. He talks about how generals are never really replaced or fires of fire unless they have a zipper problem. Yes. Um, <laughs> Why is that relevant? <laughs> I, I want, you barely mentioned media. I want to also kind of talk about media and the military. Yep. Mm. How can we move away from where we are as a political and just the culture that we live in now, where even when there is a prominent general having a zipper problem, we're fawning over his yeah. service and fawning over his heroism. Mm. Mm. Um, the, the blatant misogyny aside, how can we get to a point where we are able to criticize the military without appearing un-American? Yeah. Mm. Well, that's a great question. I mean, the, the, the context for this broadly is the fact that um, is the fact that the military is the most trusted institution in American life. Congress the least trusted, military the most trusted. Uh, it's the only institution that's gained trust in the general social survey and Pew and Gallup surveys over the course of the failed decade. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Despite One, the wars, right? Despite the wars. Oh, yeah, very much yeah. despite the wars, and I think because of the wars, right. actually. Right. Because I think people, A, rightly don't hold the military responsible for entrance into the wars. Mm -hmm. um, B, there are certain logistical within the framework of what the military is asked to do that they seem to do very well. And then I think there's a certain societal guilt and pathos built in around the fact that we have basically asked 1% of the population to shoulder the entire burden of 11 years of war while basically everyone else gets off, except for, of course, the people in their, that 1% that lives. Chris, did you endorse the draft in your book? No, although I toyed with it. Okay. Okay. Why didn't you endorse the draft? Oh, God. I, I think it's such a hard call. I, I basically worry about just the unintended consequence of... You, we think... I think the left version for the draft is that it creates this accountability that will make us think twice. The, the other idea is that 
Doesn't it decrease social distance? It does. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing decreases social <laughs> And in fact, there's a reason that the, the social democracies of Europe all have, almost all of them have compulsory service. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that there's something to be said for compulsory service. There's nothing, there's basically nothing in American life that we all do together anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, I guess, watch Sunday Night Football, but, but, right. um, <laughs> but, so, so in terms of the Petraeus thing, right? ta and I have basically been talking about this all day. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot, a set of complicated feelings about it. Um, one, I think it does reveal that there was a lot of myth-making and that there's been a lot of, because I think there's this kind of penumbra of guilt around the wars we've been waging and the distance that civilian society has from military society, society that that's manifested itself in this way of talking about the military that could almost be the way I compare it is the way that like your slightly racially unenlightened white grandparents would talk about Asian people <laughs> as like really good at math, <laughs> which is like complimentary, but also like condescending and reductive and doesn't fully grok the fact that you're talking about millions of people. The United States Armed Forces is 1.5 million people, I think. Like, there are some real scoundrels and some totally incredible saintly people and a lot of things in between. And, and some people who can be both from one minute to the next. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways the most complex writing about that have come from people within the services themselves. I mean, you wanna hear critiques of the military and the military bureaucracy, just like talk to a private first class. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think in some ways it is a product, I think some of the, some of the sort of weird reductive ass way that we talk about the military, not as the tremendously complex institution it is, um, has to do with that distance. You know, when, when, when people are writing um, Catch-22 and The Naked and the Dead, you know, they, they served in World War II, and every one of that generation served in World War II. And the, basically, you know, and Kurt Vonnegut, and, you know, so all of this stuff comes out of a society in which there's just much more of an enmeshed, there's much less distance. And I say this as someone who's, you know, I didn't serve, basically no one in my family has. It's, it, is, it is distant to me. I've done some reporting on it. Um, there's a portion of the book about it. But I think that like lack of intimacy, and particularly, the, and I think it's it's really dangerous because it has allowed us to basically have war in perpetuity, without ever having to live up to that, without ever having to be accountable for it, and particularly now as we move towards war in perpetuity, enacted by robots, mm. Mm. that further takes us off the hook. Mm. Which is like this is the ultimate social distance. This is the ultimate social distance is between you and a drone circling overhead of Waziristan, right. and that I think is even more dangerous. Now, it's a net improvement in terms of the lives of our fellow citizens who are being put on the line, to who we owe a tremendous amount of fidelity and respect as fellow citizens that we, through the democratic process, have directed to take on the horror of war. But to the degree that we remove ourselves even further in this next iteration of war making from closeness to what it means to be at war, we're going to do ourselves a disservice and do bad things in the world. Uh, young lady, right here with the scarf on. Uh, how do women fit into this? <laughs> Into what specifically? <laughs> into this meritocracy. Are they their own distinct meritocracy? Or are they a distinct part of the meritocracy? I guess specifically, I'm concerned with women in academia. So I think that, I think basically the, you know, both the changes in the political economy and second wave feminism were part, were happening at the moment when this kind of meritocratic vision really was forged. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's true about women, and it's also true, I think, uh, racially, that the system's ideals are far more broad-minded than the reality of the 
implementation. Um, so the official line is gay or straight, black or white or Latino, man or woman, we all compete on the level playing field. But of course, that's not actually how it works out. Now, there are some ways in which the adoption of that model in terms of things like um, women workforce participation, graduation from law and uh, in legal and, and medical professions have made tremendous gains. Median incomes, um, particularly for educated women, have, have gone up quite considerably. But, you know, corporate boards are absurd. There's, you know, there's something like in the, I want to say in the Fortune 500, there's like six women CEOs. You know, it's insane. Um, and to me, it's, it's part of the natural networks of, of kind of associative patronage that subvert the meritocracy. Mm -hmm. We just went through an election where we had uh, abortion was, you know, obviously a high button issue. Uh, I guess no one will decide to run on rape anymore. <laughs> How could that be a bad idea? <laughs> Stun, shell shock. Um, I wonder where that, that, that fits in at all. Is there a, a meritocratic pro-choice argument about hmm. economic fairness, competition? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my politics on it are, are incredibly uncreative in the sense that I just completely wholeheartedly buy the feminist argument right. for choice right. as autonomy, right. self-determination. Right. Um, uh, and I, I think that the, I think what was interesting is that the, the conversation around choice and birth control, and we should be very we should be very rigorous and specific when we talk about choice because I think mm -hmm. particularly people on the left can lose sight of the fact that the gender breakdown on choice is really not what you would think if you're a liberal pro-choicer. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Like there, is, there isn't the huge gap between men and women on this issue that one would think. Mm -hmm. um, there's also not the generational gap you would think. In fact, people under 35 tend to be a little more pro-life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we have, we have a bunch of kind of assumptions about public opinion and, and, and the broadest truth you can say about public opinion towards abortion is that it is a total self-contradictory mess mm -hmm. that people will be all over the place, depending on how you ask the question that mm -hmm. basically does the default is abortions are bad and they should be, they should, the, abortions are bad. We shouldn't have them except in the cases of <laughs> Right. Rape, incest, someone I know, right. myself, <laughs> my sister, my wife, my wife, my, my wife, sister, my right. girlfriend. So my girlfriend definitely. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, my that's girlfriend. totally. That is that is basically. I mean, so, but I do think that, and and to sort of respond about the, the rhetoric in the campaign and also your question because I do think that part of the the potency of the radicalization that happened, I think, among certain women that I know, particularly, and women broadly, I think, in the electorate around these issues, was seeing in real time the distance between our rhetoric about gender equity and the reality of the vestigial force of patriarchy. That, like, it's just clear for all our talk about the fact that we have a level playing field, there's going to be 20 female senators, which is a record out of a body of 100, mm. right? That's ridiculous. The U.S. ranks in female elected representatives, the U.S. ranks somewhere like 135. It's behind, like, it's right around, like, Azerbaijan, I want to say, like, <laughs> and which is not to, like, diss Azerbaijan. I don't, I don't know enough about the internal politics of Azerbaijan. They're doing quite well, that. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> many, many, you know, many nations have requirements for female representation, mm. just written into the Constitution, particularly mm. in the kind of the sort of post-colonial age of, of, of newer constitutions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that seeing the distance between the rhetoric we have, which is that like, it's all equal and it's open to everyone. And the, and the fact that of that, the fact that the power in this country is just continues to be wielded overwhelmingly like men mm -hmm. by men mm -hmm. um, was part of the potency of the, the, the backlash that I think some of this uh, rhetoric caused. Mm -hmm. Uh, how about uh, gentleman right here with the glasses? Yeah. Yes, you, you, no, you right here. Yes, you, I'm pointing at you. Yes, go ahead, you. I have a question that concerns uh, oil and climate change. Yes. And how this fits into our society. I think it enables um, 
those people at the top to get where they are. And we've, we've lost the social distance in this question is from the support structure that we separated ourselves from. Oil is enabled. We're eating oil. Right. You know? mm -hmm. and, and climate change is, is probably going to cause it to crash right in on us. So I just I, I want to put that yeah, I mean, in there. The, 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 we have the same relationship to our energy production that I think we, and then I'm talking we broadly as um, you're, you know, Americans in general, have to the wars we fight, which is that it happens somewhere else and it's done by someone else. And then I turn on my light. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, now what's fascinating about fracking is that it's actually destroying that. It's not happening somewhere else. It's happening in your backyard. And turns out people don't like that. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm, I, I'm reading a book called Carbon Democracy, which is a fascinating book by Professor Columbia on, on kind of the way in which America is structured by its energy extraction. Um, I'm not sure I can... I have thought through the relationship between the book's critique about meritocracy and elites and, the, and, our, and our system of energy production, but I do think we are incredibly removed from it. And I think that removal allows us to basically let a lot of terrible things happen because we don't see them. Um, and that's particularly true of coal, not just in mountaintop removal in West Virginia, which, you know, I've never been to West, well, I have been to West Virginia, but a lot of people have never been to West Virginia and, you know, they got to do what they got to do. Um, but also just in terms of what coal does to us humans, it kills people. Um, and then, of course, the ultimate abstraction, which is the fact we're warming the planet. Um, you know, to me, this is the, the single most important issue, you know, by a lot of factors. Um, and the abstractness is a huge problem for solving it politically. Um, Climate advocates have been citing polling recently, which is very heartening polling, which is that after a long period of decline in the public's interest in the issue, in the long period of decline, and by long I mean about a, you know eight, ten years, in which less and less people were saying that humans were warming the planet, those trends have reversed themselves. And I actually think that the freak weather we've seen and the weather catastrophes have had a real effect. But the problem is that the people who are saying that are still just telling some pollster something. Hmm. And the only things that matter in public opinion are the things you're willing to fight with your relatives over Thanksgiving dinner at. <laughs> the things that get your cheeks flush are the things that matter in American politics. And everything else is just left to the special interests to wrestle out behind closed doors. So the only way to solve this is that there's got to be some group of citizens that care about it enough that it does make their cheeks flush that they will argue with their relatives at the Thanksgiving table. And I've gone from my thinking about this politically that the project is fundamentally a persuasion project to a project of being essentially a mobilization project. That it's not about persuasion. It's about mobilizing the people that have the disposition or instinct to get radicalized on the issue, which is what we need. We need people to be radicalized on the issue, to get them over that barrier to get radicalized, because that's the only way it's going to get solved. Another question. Right here in the front. Yes, you. Yes, you. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to the social distance and proximity thing you were talking about because, um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's just proximity that's the issue. I mean, things like the Stanford prison experiment show that as human beings, we have an amazing capacity to distance ourselves from others and see them as completely different to us and lose all empathy. And so, I mean, I don't know if it's the case that people on Wall Street didn't know that people were losing their homes and had horrible mortgages. It's just that under their value system, they didn't care. And so, if it's not just proximity that's going to help, like how do we how do we make ourselves more empathetic? Hmm. You stumped them. <laughs> yeah, I guess I I guess I think that. So I guess I'm pretty romantic in this, and that I do think that some proximity will help. I think people are all things being equal, right? Um, CP, if we, if, we, if we hold everything else constant, um, I think more, more involvement, more exposure will make people more empathetic. And, you know, there's, there's places where we see this in action, right, in politics. Like, 
there's been some studies of public opinion toward immigration, right? And the places where you're finding the most virulent anti-immigrant um, sentiment are places that are just being exposed to mass immigration, whereas places that have been exposed to it for a long time don't have it. So there is some idea in which I think, and again, my, maybe this is hopeful, um, because I'm not sure we can engineer mass empathy. I think the best we can do is just hold people at the top accountable enough and force them to reckon with everyone else enough that we kind of preserve the ethos of democracy. Uh, right here in the back, you. Yeah, you. you. Um, just to, you know, the Petraeus thing was brought up, but another big issue that's probably more relevant from a policy perspective is the fiscal cliff slope or whatever it's Curb. <laughs> the austerity phase in. Right, exactly, whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, progressives are pretty happy with the election results, but just from both of you in terms of what you're hearing, what you're reporting, do you, are you both of you concerned that the administration is going to be as eager to make a deal as they were last year? That, you know, what, are you, what are your both of your just general thoughts about what we're facing in terms of safety net programs at risk and what, what, what's Coming down the path over the next several weeks, months. Can I speak first? I don't want to go after you. No, please. Okay, please. Right. <laughs> I was going to say something smart. And I was listening to this guy at lunch, and I was just kind of like, okay, um, <laughs> I just hope, I just really, really hope, I really, really, like, Barack Obama has this natural thing to buy this whole totally. fever broke. Right. If he were broke, now they're saying, you know, clearly they'll make a good. That scares the hell out of me. I mean, it just really, really scares the hell that somehow, I think he believes too much in his persuasive power. And I think on the left in general, there's too much belief in the power of reason. Um, I say that as a believer in reason, but the notion that I will craft a better, what did he say before the debt ceiling? Somebody asked him about uh, the debt ceiling. Yeah, they're they're gonna be, Mark Amender asked him, Mark Amender asked him in the first press conference after the midterms, That's right. the, the, this debt ceiling thing is going to happen. He said, well, I think now that they have to govern, they're going to be, they're going to be different. They're going to be responsible. And he said, John Boehner would never do that. Yeah. John, John yeah. Boehner doesn't want to endanger America. Yeah. <laughs> go, go. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm concerned. I mean, I'm concerned. First of all, I think the entire framing of the discussion is crazy. Um, and, you know, I've, I've ranted. That, Chris, the framing? I don't, I mean, I don't want to belabor this point because I, like ranted about this on my show this weekend, but first of all, Washington uses the words deficit and debt. They, they, they're running a linguistic hustle on America <laughs> in which they say something that doesn't mean what they say it means. What, what the debt means in Washington is things I don't like or policies I don't like. That's it. Every time you hear someone talk about the deficit, replace it with policies I don't like. Because everyone's just trying to use this leverage to take the knife to whatever they're, and, and, and that's true, I think, on both sides, right? I mean, like, the reason we have to raise taxes on the wealthy is because of the deficit and debt. Well, sort of. I mean, it's about $50 billion a year, which isn't nothing, but it's, in the overall scheme of things, not enough. Now, I think we need to raise taxes on the wealthy for a million different reasons. But, so I think there's just, what, 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 what infuriates me is that this is a disingenuous conversation. It's having, an, it's, have, it's a conversation that over the course of it has managed to move remarkably even to the right. It just keeps getting dragged to the right about what is the negotiating tent pole? Like what's the center around we're gonna have the conversation? And the thing that drives me the craziest is that there is no conversation in Washington about mass unemployment. Mm -hmm. We are lighting people's lives on fire. We are literally, someone, I, a woman got up at the microphone last night when I was in Miami. She said, I'm 24 years old, I graduated from the new school, I've been out of work for a year, I can't try and find a job. What can you tell me? And I said, we're failing, we are failing you. And we're not just failing you from some moral perspective, we are literally taking the thing that you have, which is your productive capacity, and we are lighting it on fire. We are putting dynamite around it and blowing it up. 
And people talk about waste, government waste, wasteful spending. We're wasting this, we're wasting that. We are wasting people's lives. Mm. We are wasting people's lives. Mass unemployment is a massive waste. It's a waste of productive capacity. It is like you walk down the street here with a sledgehammer and just started breaking people's windows. That is what we're doing right now. And no one in Washington seems to care. We're going to talk about how we're going to reduce our deficit projections in the out years to 2025, and maybe we'll make these. And meanwhile, on and on and on and on and on it goes. And it's just, it's, it's, it's infuriating, and it comes back to the, the point that you made, the point that David Frum made. As soon as unemployment reduced amongst the people at the top, as soon as the fever of the crisis had broken, mm -hmm. As soon as it wasn't the case that everyone, even in law firms, knew folks that were getting laid off, everyone stopped caring about unemployment. Mm -hmm. Unemployment. I just, I just want yeah. to challenge you just on a, a little bit. We heard about it a lot in the campaign, right? And the unemployment number comes out, and you know, oh, this is good news for me. So I just, so what do you make of that? Is that a serious conversation, or we heard a lot about the well, we heard we heard about the number. But we didn't hear much about the problem, and we also just didn't hear, there was no, you know, Barack Obama proposed a piece of legislation that would create about a million jobs called the American Jobs Act. Went before Congress, addressed a joint session of Congress. Did Barack Obama say the words the American Jobs Act once in his three debates? Mm -hmm. This was a piece of legislation that would have put people back to work, that the Republicans killed, that just never appeared. We have time for one more question, and then I, I want to make sure we get books signed. How about right here in the front, please? Okay, so having just come out of the college admissions process, I wanted to ask you about something that's mm. close to my heart. And I wanted to know what your thoughts are on affirmative action. So you mm. mentioned social distance several times, and one of the arguments in favor of affirmative action is that it decreases this gap and increases proximity. And so do you think that such a program is completely incompatible? with meritocracy, or do they go hand in hand? So it's a great question about, in case you guys didn't hear out there, about affirmative action and meritocracy and, and their compatibility. Um, so I'm a big supporter of affirmative action. Um, in fact, I'm a supporter of like incredibly aggressive affirmative action. Um, and I, I'll speak for how we conduct our shows every weekend, which is that we just cap the amount of white men that could be on the show. <laughs> it's just the most crude format. We just say no more than two white men, basically. Mm -hmm. And sometimes here and there we'll make allowances or exceptions. Mm -hmm. I don't count myself. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> you got me. Um, so. So I think, you know, I think um, there's, I have a, a lot of thoughts about this, I right. guess is my, my point. I gotta, I'm sorry, I just yeah. gotta push you because this is very, very important here at MIT, which yeah. is really, I have to say, at least challenged my thoughts on affirmative action. And that is, and I think we talked about this early, earlier today, um, one of my great thoughts not great in terms of quality, but <laughs> great in terms that keeps banging me in the head, that we ask different sectors of our society, from our school system, from our housing policy, to answer for the fact that we had white supremacist, po white supremacist policies in this country right. up until the mid-1960s, so within the living memory of a great deal of people. Right. Um, and yet, there are people here, a lot of them here at MIT, uh, there's a suit right now uh, in, in the school system uh, in New York City, you wrote about Hunter, uh, who are not a part of that, right. who are being penalized uh, right. for it. Many of them Asian, Asian American, what have you. It has been an education, you talk about social distance, right? Yeah. It's been a real education for me to come here and to actually have to talk to somebody who would be penalized uh, in that sort of way. I wonder what you make of that. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a thornier problem than it looks from afar. Mm -hmm. um, if we're going to talk in the crassest terms of racial classification, which I hate to do because racial classification is problematic and socially constructed, etc., but Asian Americans are the big losers of any regime of affirmative action. Mm -hmm. just, it's just an empirical fact. Um, 
And these are people we need, right? I mean, like the, the great argument from the meritocratic American yes. argument is this is who we want, the guy who's going to, the woman who's going to work hard, you know, study, da 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 That's, but, you know, but, the, but the, here's the thing that we need to do, I think. The, we, the, there's so many things to kind of unpack about the terms of the debate, right? One is the ease with which we know what merit is or what mm. it looks like mm. or that can be diagnosed mm. or it can be defined or it can be named in this neat way, whether that's testing achievement, um, grades, etc. right? So that's one thing that is it just merit is something that it's it's got this kind of tautological quality to it. But when you start to interrogate it, it's a much messier concept than it looks when you talk, throw it around. Mm -hmm. Hey, B, you know, my big feeling about this is that the hydraulic pressure that's happening way, way, way up the waterfall is the problem, which is to say the way that we have conceived of American life is this kind of dystopic, iterative, tournament-style competition, like a never-ending March Madness, mm -hmm. right. in which everybody is constantly pitted off against each other in these brackets, going down to get to the, be the little select winner who hoists the trophy at the end. And the hoist the trophy at the end is, the trophy is a remunerative job and a fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. And the broad vision of the left for years is that everybody gets a trophy. Seriously, everyone should have a fulfilling life, fulfilling work, and be able to afford a modicum of comfort in the one of the wealthiest societies ever produced in human life. And so as long as we keep conceiving in these tournament terms, in which there's this scarce commodity of educational attainment that everyone's fighting for, mm -hmm. then we're going to have these very ugly trade-offs. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question is, well, how do you operationalize that? And that's a broader question. Right. But I think the first thing to do is just like really question the kind of funneling issue. Right. In the narrow policy standpoint, I think that I'm a, I'm a huge believer in affirmative action. Um, and again, for a bunch of uncreative reasons, both in terms of diversity, both in terms of historical historical reasons, which I think are important, even though the historical argument for affirmative action has been completely jurisprudentially jettisoned in in the cases that have came, come before the court. It's basically been um, jettisoned in the most recent case and now has left the constitutional justification for it hanging by a very, very thin thread. Right, right. Uh, and we might not have affirmative action much longer after it's yeah. looking like. Uh, this was so great. I'm sorry. Thank uh, you, guys. Didn't get in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is going to sign both sides. Thank you all. 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 Th